coming to you from the Deep South. This is the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast. High impact leadership is not reserved for leaders, and it has nothing to do with your position, title, or rank. However, it does have everything to do with your character. It's time to climb to the next level and beyond, personally and professionally. Now, let's start making it happen with your host, Max Story. Hello, everyone. Thank you for stopping by the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast today. On today's episode, I got a a, a special friend, Mr. Greg Williams. Uh, Some of you may know him as the six-time national champion in Auburn University, a equestrian coach. He's accomplished some amazing things, and I believe he led his his team. He started in 1996, if I'm right. I'll let him correct me if I make any mistakes in a moment when I get him introduced, but I think he started the uh, Auburn University equestrian, equestrian program back in 1996 and he's uh led his first team to their first national championship in 2006 and he's done some amazing things like i said six-time national champion five out of the last nine years they've been national champions and he was well on his way with another undefeated second in a row undefeated season this year and then the coronavirus crisis kind of put a damper on that but has accomplished some amazing things and you're going to find out pretty quick, I'm sure, that Greg is a, a humble man, and I thank the world of him. And I met him, Re and I actually met him back in 2011. We we showed up to a state park to uh, start building some mountain bike trails, and we were standing there with a shovel in our hand, and, and Greg and Sandy Williams were standing next to us, and we started talking, and we, we've been friends ever since. So welcome to the show, Greg. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad to be on here. And you guys, you guys have done done some stuff. Tell me about this season. Well, this season was uh, off to an amazing start. We we finished last year with something that I didn't even know was really going to be possible in our sport. You knew it was, uh, you know, it was a, I guess a possible outside chance. But to me, to go undefeated in this sport when you've got to, you know, when you travel and you're on the host team's horses, even though you go head to head on the same horse, still the host school knows them, and so. Picking up road wins is really rare. To try to win all of them was something you didn't even focus on. So having an undefeated team last year was just uh, something I thought would never be repeated. And then lo and behold, uh, after graduating the best senior class that I guess has ever existed in our sport, we had a bunch of freshmen dive in and and, uh, hook up with the upperclassmen and just kept the ball rolling. We were undefeated this year, um, ready for an extremely good postseason, and uh, uh, got canceled. Wow, man, that's that's amazing what you've accomplished. And did I get it right that you started the equestrian team in Auburn in 1996? Yeah, I did. Started the team. I was already. I came back to Auburn. I was a professional in the horse business, and um, Auburn. Had, they called me. Said they want to do something with a horse program, and uh, you know, this I did a lot of growing up here. This is uh, on that on the same piece of dirt rod now is how I paid for my you know, my way through college, and. So I really wasn't ready to get out of the training business at that point. I was really young, and but I told my wife, I said, the thought of being able to raise our kids, we just had had our second child. I thought, thought of being able to raise them in Auburn, it's a dream come true, and this isn't going to come open again in our lifetime, so we better jump on it. So um, we did move to Auburn, and I was working, you know, trying to build up a horse program, and then in 96, I uh, started a team. It was a club team, and I just started it with a handful of girls. And we grew it out of that, uh, made it into a varsity sport in 2002, and try not to look back. <laughs> There's a lot. That's, that's a lot of transformation that happened in, in your life to be there, I'm sure. And that's that's one reason I want to invite you to be on. Why I'm, I'm doing a lot of interviews right now this time of the year in between. This is the year I'm focusing my podcast on the, the word transformation. So the first part of the year has been on okay. personal transformation. and. And then the second half is going to be on cultural transformation. But mm-hmm. you, you mm-hmm. just—I mean, you've transformed the sport. I mean, you there's there's nobody in the—I'm you know I'm not a, into the world of equestrian coaching. You and I are just friends, and 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 I supported you with leadership back in 2013. You and your team, but I, I don't know a lot well, about it. But there's nobody doing what you you've done, right? Well, I, you know we. 
I don't know the the the, the shift into the format that we used in the NCAA was yet yeah, something that I that I had created, but it was really you know it's in transformation. Boy, I don't know if anybody has transformed much more than I have. But um, to me, I, I, I tell people you just really just need to be a good thief. I mean, it, it, it you don't you don't even have to be anything amazing, but the uh, the tools, the information, everything's out there. You just got to start taking it. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, you, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, I wind up speaking now, and, and I remember there was a guy saying, he, he said, you know, I remember you, and he came up from the audience, and he said, I knew you, and you wouldn't say crap if you had a mouth full of it, you know, and it was, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I had, to learn, had to learn to talk if, uh, <laughs> if we were going to build this program, if we were going to uh, bring in money and sponsors, and um, so that's, it, it's been a journey, and uh, it, it has been fun. So how do, so how do you how do you stay at the level season after season? It's hard enough, probably. I imagine to get one championship. I've never done anything like that. But I, how how do you do it over and over, like five times in the last nine years? How do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna split that question into a couple of things, but I'll let you answer them separate. But how do how do you do it personally? You know, how do you stay at that level to even be able to to bring another team to that level? And then how do you get the team to that level? So first time is how do you as an individual? You know, as the head coach, I, I, do, I, I think for a long time, I think for a long time, Matt, you can run off your own passion, your own energy, and you can really take something from nothing and get it up for a while. It's, uh, you know, I tell people that, uh, you know, hope is, is just the most incredible piece that you got to have. I mean, that's what starts the dreams going, but then vision. Um, you, you've got to have a big vision, and you've got to be able to constantly visualize what you're trying to get to but then you got to put the work in you know it's uh um shoot i know you've talked about it before i think you you've talked about if you remember one of your books i remember because it reminded me of one of our practices um i know what you said hope's not a strategy and i always love that because i had a, a girl coaching me lindsey newbar I mean, she's a lady but um i remember one time that she she made the statement where this Sometimes people just kind of hope everything's going to come out to the best. You know, I hope this will happen for me. And, I, and you know, so what you put is hope, hope's a strategy. But I mean, she was talking to this girl, and she said, listen, you know, I understand that you're praying this ride's going to turn out well, but you can't get to the fence just praying. You've got to pray and ride. And, uh, you know, that's the truth. You've got to, you've got to have hope and ride you, 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 or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so to get back to the question, so you've got it, but the visualization is a big piece. Visualize where you're going, but then you've got to put in the effort. But the effort is uh, happens automatically. If your reason why is big enough, the effort just follows right behind. And um, never lose the sight of a dream. Just don't, just don't 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 give up on that. Just keep the dream out in front of you, and and uh, um, you know that that's what keeps me awake. I mean, I. I I still dream, I visualize, look at rosters, um, you know, we're, and this is, I mean, this is the honest truth, as when I won the national championship last year, undefeated seasons, never happened before, and my wife tells the story, people are always asking her, you know, I mean, is, is you know, is coach on cloud nine, is he just, and, and she says, depending <laughs> on who I'm talking to, I'll tell him the truth, or, or I'll say, oh, he's just so happy, but you know, most people just say, you know, no, the truth is he was already worried about next year. And it was. As they handed me the trophy, I was literally looking around the arena knowing which team, who, which seniors are losing, who I know they've got coming in next year. And all I was worried about was, was the next season already as I'm standing in the arena being handed that national championship trophy. It's, uh, to me, the arrival is very short-lived. It's uh, the excitement of life is chasing dreams. Yeah, chasing dreams. And, and, and you said... You said something we talked yesterday, just briefly preparing for today, and and you said something about happiness and pursuing goals. Talk about that for a moment. Well, that is I, it. Kind of fits in that. Listen, I as much as anybody thought, boy, if I just had this, and and I would just love for this to happen. And but I, the one thing I do know, you can talk to the people that have whatever it is that you're talking about, that have a lot of money, that 
you know, they'll say over and over, you know, well, that's not what makes you happy. And you want to say, well, you know, let me try it a while. I'll see if it's true. But I, I do believe that. And uh, now it is a better situation if you can get out of some of the really, really tough times, which, uh, you know, I've been in. My wife and I, we put ourselves through college together and uh, did that with a kid. And, I mean, there, there's, some, there's some times that I don't want to go back to. Um, but it did make us what we are today, and the truth is we were just as happy, a little bit more of a stress level at times. Uh, um, you know, when, when people that are really trying to figure out how to get through their bills, and we're going to have a lot of that coming up this year, um, it, it, it is it is hard to, um, to picture the big stuff. But, you know, really getting, you know, the, your next goal is that then. You know, when you're in that position, it's, it's what do I do to get out of this situation, and and your, your dreams don't have to be grandiose, but they, they need to be bigger, you know, a little bit larger than what you're just going to accomplish automatically. Um, but yeah, it is. I mean, this year is going to challenge people a lot. It's going to tra- it's going to change what they were dreaming of. Um, you know, like that the quote I heard a speaker one time say, it's just really hard uh, to make long term plans when. Um, well, oh, he was uh, actually he was uh, shot down over in Vietnam, and uh, mm. you know you, you're supposed to be making you know this plan of what you do in your land, how you start your escape, and you know there's all this series of stuff that you run through that they've trained for, but they yeah. were actually shooting at him as he's parachuting down, which is against all rules of war, and uh, but no, nonetheless it was happening to him, and he said you know it is really hard to make a long range plan when you're do- dodging bullets. And uh, yeah, um, so that's so so. Don't be surprised when you find yourself in those times, and everybody will. There are just times in your life when you're dodging bullets, and uh, you you may not think that you're being as big a thinker as you should be. Uh, but once you get on stable ground and uh, you, you you've evaded those bullets, you do need to make sure that you keep your keep your dreams and and your visualizing of what you want out ahead of you. And that's the only thing that drives you. Yeah, that's that's some good stuff right there. So, so when you have, you know, obviously you've had both. You've had last season where you won a national championship, and you've had last season where you didn't win a national champion championship. Mm-hmm. Do you mm-hmm. do you change anything? Like, you know, last oh, year that, you that, 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 that is, is a, it different from year to year, depending on. You know, we've got happened. through time, through time, how you coach changes a lot. Uh, the way student athletes come in now is very different from how they. Uh, you know, came in in the in the early 2000s, um, but we try to keep the same culture of hard work in place. That's something, and, and you know, I tell people, listen, I'm just old school, but it works. Um, our kids do a lot of the work there. I mean, they paint fences, they build stuff, and all of it is because I want that to be their place. Uh, it's not a slogan, and that's one thing that I think we've robbed a lot of kids from is. They kind of feel like they can watch a pump-up video, uh, you know, off their phone. They can watch YouTube, this athlete, the hard work they're doing. And somehow in there, there's like this message that it has made them better. No, I mean, you've just watched a pump-up. That guy in the video that's putting in the work is getting better. You've not done anything. And I think there is a lost piece, as as one one speaker I heard one time, he, he, he um, so that a lot of our youth, he calls them slacktivists. He did. They care a lot about the world, but they just care about liking it on Facebook. They don't want to do anything about it. And um, mm. I think that I think that sometimes our our great technology has robbed people from actually getting out and making things happen. You know, because they can just watch other people make things happen over and over. Um, but so yeah, keeping that's... the culture in. So when they're working on that place, though, I tell them when another when another team comes up our drive. Uh, it's not a slogan for us. This protective house, it is their house. They have a vested interest in it. The more of a vested vested interest you can have in something, a program or place, um, you're gonna you're gonna accomplish more with it. So uh, that's something that I really really try to uh, keep instilled in them, and and I, I do think it sets them apart. You know, it's uh, it's it's not a slogan for them. It literally is their place. And it makes them, you know, I didn't know that, that they did that. But you're, you're saying the, the the young ladies that ride the horses, they're, they're actually maintaining the, the stables, like in the farm and the fence. Is, is that what you're telling me? Maybe farm. Yeah, not and not, right not I don't know the lingo. Not, yeah, not exclusively. But, yeah, like every arena out there that's been built out of wood, I've done it with the girls on the team. And we built it ourselves. 
Um, wow. So we've done it for years. Used to, that had no choice early on. So there's a lot of people that, you know, talked about, we wish we could put your culture and our team. We wish, and I get that. We had to. We had no choice. So our hardworking culture came out of uh, necessity. Um, what I would do now in their shoes, I don't know. In some of these established sports, it's very hard to uh, bring in that type of culture because you're up against a bunch of other teams that are recruiting and working and saying, you don't have to do this, and here's what's just given to you. And, it, and mm. um, it's, hard, it's hard sometimes to beat that out. But in the long run, when we get those that have the talent and buy into every aspect of being the team, we win for a long time. You know, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna take some boss. You're gonna lose some recruits. Some that can actually uh, cost you some points. You know they're gonna beat you time to time. But uh, day in and day out, if you'll stay committed to those that uh, have talent, that also will buy into putting the others first. Um, that's who, that's who you can win long term with. Yeah, and it you know it's a leadership trait of uh, a, a good character trait, but a leadership trait too of delivering results. So when when you got these other mm-hmm. schools. Comp- competing with you and they offering all this stuff but when, when you can say what we do at Auburn has generated six national championships and you, I guess from now on it's always going to be almost you know one more because this year would have been a, another one I'm, I'm sure yes yeah. yeah yeah but then you have two undefeated seasons you got in the books you got six national championships mm-hmm. that those results give you a lot more influence with the recruits I'm sure compared to somebody I who think so. doesn't have these I, I think so, but you, again, we go back to team mentality. There are some greats, and I mean, this has been verified by basketball coaches. This is how it was done. Uh, Larry Bird transferred from Indiana, if I understand right, because he really didn't want to play into the team mentality. He wanted to be somewhere that was more individual. And um, so, and and while I get that, you can't. I mean, you can't fault what a great, great, phenomenal player he was. Um, and particularly when you're just one of five, it makes a big difference. Um, when you take the girl, you know, we're our team, we're the second largest team at Auburn next to football. We've got 40 girls on our roster that we keep. And you, you've got to keep that team mentality. And our girls, they can go pro right out of high school. They, can, they, they are already competing at the highest level as an individual. And, and I tell them, if, if you're not going to come here to be a member of a team and win as a team, you'd be missing the whole point. You don't need Auburn to compete at the highest level like some sports do. I mean, if you don't make a Division One team or a pro team, you're done. You know, mm-hmm. in some of these other sports, um, ours you can compete as an individual forever. So, um, okay, if, if they don't choose, if they don't choose to be on the team mentality, they're missing the whole point of it. You know, because um, they don't need us to compete at that level. They need us if they want to want the full team experience and, and what you gain gain from that because it is remarkable you use the word transformation it is a remarkable deal to watch these girls that fully engage in the team and just how they transform themselves and others by, by buying into that that's awesome so what you're saying though is someone who goes pro who skips college they go pro and they're on their own there is no team sport there is right, an individual right, sport right, as right. a pro I mean, you know, they can say you know a lot of them they try to keep a whole team mentality with the other people in the barn you know that we're all working for the same but they're all competing individually you know their their okay. points don't combine with anybody else to win okay so how do you how do you first first on an individual team member on on your equestrian team what how you define mm-hmm. them because I'm going to ask you the question I want to lead up to is how do you recruit winners? But I want to I want to say I want you to tell me what what is a winner on your team? Meaning a winner? What kind of person is a winner? Not winner like winning winning the the, the the event. I'm talking about winning as a human being. What 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 is a winner when you go in to recruit somebody? What does that what does that person look like? Well, the the one thing that I mean you can ask this. I mean. I say probably more than anything else, I said it the very first night I started the team in, in 1996, is you've got to be willing to plant a seed for a tree you're never going to shade under. So you've got mm-hmm. to be willing to work for stuff that you're not going to get the reward for. And that's very hard to do. I mean, it's extremely hard. I mean, you, you've got an 18-year-old into them, just the four years of college sounds like an eternity. And now, I mean, four years can flash from me like a blink of an eye. 
And but for them, four years just sounds forever. And I thought, what do you mean I'm working for somebody? You know that I something I'm never even going to see the results for. So that that piece is, uh, you know, it's hard to do. But we asked them to buy into that. The other things. So I'm mean, going to tell you all my things that I drill in over and over and over. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, I like it. Okay, is, is that piece? And I say, if you come to Auburn, you got to be willing to put the other 39 girls ahead of yourself. Mm, and if you do that, you'll have the greatest experience ever. So we say that over and over and over. The other thing that I say at the end of every meet, you could call any one of my girls and ask them, what does he say at the end of, of, of the meet? And I say, I always say, you are, and they finish with my sister's keeper. And wow. that means you've got to take care of each other. You've got to watch each other's back. may not even be just the, the normal favorite teammate you would hang out with. But you have their backs and keep each other out of trouble. We can deal with the, we can deal with something later. But you know, in the situations, because you're in a college town, you've got a lot of parties and you've got a lot of situations. They need to watch each other's back for. They can deal with it later. But you know, their only goal asks them to get them, anybody and everybody get them, keep them in safe places and get them out of bad situations. So, you are your sister's keeper. Is, is the other is the last thing that I drill in pretty hard. So. They hear that on the, they hear that on their visit. Now, do we miss some? Absolutely, you know. And a lot of people want to believe that that's them, but then Mac, it's very hard to do it. I mean, you teach leadership, and there's a lot of people they want to have those principles, but just just first reading the book without really engaging a book isn't going to do it. You know, just listening to a speaker without trying to engage some of those principles. Now, you're going to fail more times than you succeed. Uh, you know, I, every time I talk to, <laughs> to you, and you know this is true, I had you work with my staff one time, and I said it was a little bit depressing sometimes <laughs> because I kept, <laughs> me, I, I just kept focused on everything I'm not getting done. I thought, man, I'm not, I'm not winning in these areas. And uh, sometimes when people like you, you are saying you've created this culture, you've done this, you've done that, and sometimes I always feel like they're actually talking about somebody else besides me. I thought that I, mean, I did that, <laughs> but uh, you know, just stole, just stole from a lot of people, I guess. But uh, I feel like that's the, you know, that's something that you got to remember is, is it's you know, it's it's not easy, and you're going to fail a lot at it, but you've got to keep asking those same things of yourself too. Yeah, that's good stuff. And- you, you got a lot of humility, and I mean, it's. I, I want to touch on maybe maybe shift a little bit. Before I do that, I do want to say something. You were talking about be a, be my sister. You know, I am my sister's keeper. Is is what what you right. get them to say and get them to believe. And you know, that's a leadership principle. I learned it from, from John Maxwell. The way he says the, the way he teaches the principle is he basically saying give someone a reputation to uphold, and that's. The reputation mm-hmm. you're giving them to uphold is that they they are their sister's keeper, and you just nonstop do it. It's a reputation, in, you know. In his terms, it's a reputation you're giving them to uphold. That's that's pretty powerful, and and they probably literally do it. And there's probably a lot of examples of when they do it and things go right, and when they don't do it, things go wrong. I'm sure you point out any of those instances too, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so, I actually wrote that down. I, you know, that's a good piece when you just talk about the team because we talk about, um, you know, if you're if you're an athlete at a university, you're in a bubble, and if you ever do something wrong, that's the first thing somebody wants to point out, you know, and and they're not going to say, well, Greg Williams, freshman from, uh, you know, Prattville, Alabama, or Pearsville, Arkansas, or something. They're going to say Auburn Equestrian, you know, except for we're only female sport in NCAA, but. You know that, so you're going to get you're going to be called out in the newspaper as being an athlete, and so you know yeah. the reputation is something's very important, not just in the arena but out of the arena. And in today's world, you know, I, well, if I can say well, you know me long enough, though, I you know, I can change topics in a heartbeat. Uh, yeah, and that's yeah. A, that's a pressure that kids have today that we didn't have, and for all of the stuff that people want to you know pick on the kids today well listen that's been going on for generations you know i mean that's yep. been going on forever that's been going on i think my quotes is about you know kids today they're disrespectful and um you know they don't pay attention to teachers and uh they don't expect authority and uh, you know they would you know don't want to uh, get engaged in any meaningful discussion and they don't they don't work and they, it was like cicero and like 
300 BC. Uh, I mean, something. You know, I mean, that's it's, it's been, yeah. been said forever. You know, so you just got to get past that. Um, I think that these kids will be better prepared for the future than we are. But they have they have an they have a they have some pressure now with these phones and the videos and the, the social media. I just can't imagine uh, being under the scrutiny that they are now. And yeah. so I, I you know I, I I admire them because it's a uh, yeah I think it's easy yep. to look at back in our time than it is now. Yeah, and something I love about you, Greg, like you said a minute ago, I just wrote that down. I mean, I'm doing a podcast interview with you, and I'm kind of interviewing you, and you're taking notes. But t- talk about that a little bit, because that's the perfect thing, because I know we touched on it yesterday, but you've been talking about speakers you've been listening to. You talked about books. Now you're talking about you're writing, you're taking notes. T- talk about you as an individual, how self-development has impacted your success when did it start you know or do you do it all the time or is it something you just do every now and then tell me about your well you know i had i i do i do love to read and i had uh, a good friend of mine bob fuse he introduced me to reading uh you know business books motivational books self-help books and uh he just talked about what it would do for your attitude in fact is we we if we were ever having a, a bad conversation i mean his only question to me is what are you reading right now you know, and I mean, that was just basically nailing me, saying that your attitude is going south. So he was a big mentor for me in, in getting into, um, you know, reading. All right, so when I started the team, though, it was crucial for me because I was extremely quiet. Um, and I, I mean, I, I wasn't, it wasn't maybe a true introvert. I was just quiet. I mean, I was very happy. I had lots of friends. I was just happy with them carrying the conversation. But I had to start getting people to buy into our program. I had to start creating some donors. I had to get sponsors. And so in addition to those books, I mean, I went to our library. It's a great resource. Started reading every book I could on fundraising, reading you know, every book I could on public speaking and just you know, trying to create my own, uh, my own educational piece, which I do tell people now. Yeah. Most people really, their education drops off so hard when they leave college and that that's a shame because now you have you're at liberty to study stuff that can directly impact your business to study things that can directly change you as a person and um you know but you, you you've got you really need to become a self-directed learner and that's you know a piece that everybody should buy into and you know, we're always so quick to point out to our kids, you know, watch who you hang out with. You should hang out with this person. Well, uh, a lot of the adults need to watch who they're hanging out with. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, what, what do they say? We're like the average of the main five people we hang out with or something like that. You probably yep. know the direct quote on yep. that. That's yeah, good I enough. Mean, that's that's uh, it. Um, you know, we, we oftentimes don't – well, it's – Sometimes it's harder to hang around people that are lifting up. You know, it's easier to hang around the ones that uh, uh, just want to do the fun stuff. And um, I get it. We, we right. all are that way, and we all go through it. That's one thing I say over and over is you've got to forgive yourself. Kind of move on. You know, it's the, the greatest people out there have setbacks, you know, except for I wonder sometimes if, like, Bill Gates and them ever have a, a, a down day or not. I mean, it, I'm just <laughs> amazed at there are some of these uber successful people that what they accomplish is just mind blowing to me. Just mind blowing, yeah. you know. But for all these people, well, I just don't have time to read. I, they are. I mean, they <laughs> read uh, an extreme amount and have as they were build, building the biggest businesses that have ever existed. So, um, you know, just you just, just don't you know the excuses is, and you know and I make them too and I. But, you know, just quit telling me how rough the waters are. Just bring the ship in. You just got to just do that. Yep, you're, you're right. And and I don't know if you really know that I've, I've become personal friends with Jim, Jimmy Collins. He was the president and COO of Chick-fil-A, Truett Cathy's third employee back in 67 uh-huh. or 68. Uh-huh. He's right. been a personal friend of mine since 2015, I believe. Yeah, 2015. And, you know, he, he, he still does and he always did read 100 books a year. You know, he didn't have to do that. He was, he was building right. Chick Fil A with Truett Cathy, and just like you're just talking about those folks you named off and a bunch of others, some the most successful. Well, you talk about Truett. You know, Truett. When I first came to Auburn, before I started the team, Truett used to stop in about once a week 
when he was building Chick Fil A. So when they talk about him building, it, I know for a fact I didn't really know what Chick Fil A was going to become back then. Um, yeah. You know, and even when I heard of them, thought that's nice, but you know, I really want to kick my butt. As much as those conversations were good for me, I wish I'd asked him a few more questions. But I think he probably kind of liked it a little bit. Is he just wanted to talk horses with me, and he would stop in because he, you know, as he, they were coming from Rome, Georgia, but he stopped in Auburn just every time he was coming through, and he'd come up there, and we'd walk around and we'd talk horses, and uh, uh, so that was quite, you know, that was a, a great experience for me to. Uh, be able to spend time with him and I, I would like to ask him a few more questions but the truth was I think I was learning from him even when I didn't know it when he would just tie in a few business pieces as we were talking horses and how he was building the chick fil and what he was doing but it was very obvious he was a great man and like you said he just he still makes time I mean he made time for people he made time for reading he made time he made it almost seem effortless yet, effortless, yet he was building one of the most uh, respected chains in the country back then, yeah. you know. And yeah, then so they, you talk yeah. about somebody that holds to some principles. That was him. Yeah, man, that's that's amazing, and and uh, I use him as a as a reference quite often. So I want to shift gears again and talk about kind of going backwards in time when, when we okay. first met out met out there. You know, standing in Chihuahua State Park right down the road from from where you live and where I lived at that time. We were both living pretty close to that. And, and, right, you know, right. I got to, to know you. We were just out there to help build some trails so we'd have somewhere to ride some bikes. And then it, it evolved into we needed to create a mountain bike organization, a formal chapter of the International right. Emba, International right. Mountain Biking Association. And, and that's where I really got to know you because a lot of the folks there wanted me to be the president of the group. I was busy. I didn't want to be the president. And I remember when I decided to be, you and I were... I was pulling out of the gas station and you were turning in and we talked through the windows of our vehicles and and so somehow we were on that conversation and you said if if if, you, if you'll be the president I'll be on the board and what I was wanting was you to be on the board and apparently you want me to be the president so yeah that's, yeah. that's well, where that, that that started that day well my my uh my great great grandmother and great grandmother ran a peach orchard in Wynn, Arkansas when I was a little kid and uh, I mean, they still worked it themselves. And I said, so, but I remember spending all this time on the um, in those orchards. But when my mom was even younger, she told me that she had to help. I mean, that was part of her job as a senior. She had to go find the people to work to pick peaches um, because that's when you had to just you know quadruple your labor on the farm yep. just during the harvest time. And uh, so she was sent out to always go find people to hire. And my great grandmother always told her, said, if they're sitting on their porch, don't even talk to them. You find somebody that's mowing the yard that just got <laughs> home from work and stuff. And, and so that's a true story. And so she was always taught that. You find somebody that's already working if you're going to find, find somebody to hire. Don't find somebody that's just sitting there. So, that's yeah, you were perfect. Job. I mean, listen, if you could see our, our group text is still go on. I've I've seen a lot of volunteer organizations. I've never seen one that uh, gets as much done as this as this uh, biking group does today. Now, you know, not by me; it's by a bunch of other people. Uh, really, that just it's, it's incredible. But that culture has still built from that very first beginning, Max. So that was, you know, I was glad that you stepped in. Yet took a busy person to get it done right. Yeah, well, we were all busy. I mean, they, we had a, we built a strong team. We had a strong team of, mm-hmm. team of uh, on board members and. The officers. I mean, we got a lot of stuff done. But the reason I was wanting to go back and talk about talk about that was because because I did get to know you. You know, I've, you've invited Rhea and I over to your home several times. We've mm-hmm. been over there and mm-hmm. celebrating some of the stuff y'all were, had won. Probably I don't remember why we were there, but I, you had invited us. But it didn't take me but a minute, even out on the trails when we were working building trails. But over at your home is where I noticed it the most, and and I wrote about it in. In my book, Blue Collar Leadership, Leading from the Front Lines, Chapter 24, is, is titled, Be the First to Help. And what I learned by watching you, because we always say leadership is more caught than taught. And that's that, that's something that you really, really taught me, not, not saying it out loud, just living it. And I want to tell anybody listening, what I'm talking about is Greg, and I write about it in that chapter. And actually, there's an episode on this podcast, 88, where I talk about this more. But in that, in that chapter... I talk about Greg has like a sixth sense to help people. He just he just wants to help. If somebody's dropped dropped something, 
Greg's on his way to pick it up before it ever hits the floor, and he don't even think about it. You don't even know you do this stuff, I don't think, Greg. Well, I think it's awfully nice to you hear. Are. That's, that's <laughs> awfully nice to hear. You know, I, I, I picture my wife being that way. Sandy's incredible at it, but it's, it's nice to hear that uh, I'm not a complete failure in that anyways. So thank you. <laughs> you do. You do also. When I used to come up and do the, the teaching sessions with you and the staff at, at, at the uh, Auburn campus, I remember you always want to carry my bag out. You want to walk me to my truck, and you want to go meet me at the door. I mean, that's 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 over delivering. I mean, that's a leadership principle, right? Going the second mile over delivered. Well, well, it, it is, and that's something that uh, you know I, I try to teach our, our, our athletes, and we have to be very ca- careful with uh, hazing rules. And uh, you know, it's a big deal on campus, and we need some, absolutely need them. But sometimes I feel like the hazing crosses over into proper respect you know you can't have anybody do something that a senior doesn't have to do you can't have anybody carry the gear bags that the seniors aren't having it and you know and i tell them i I explain to them and and i say i understand those rules but in life though guys if somebody has made four years through a program as tough as ours is and stuff you want to have some respect don't ever walk empty-handed if a senior is carrying something you know, don't ever yeah. have some pride. To me, it's about pride, and it's about, you know, not letting, you know, those seniors outwork you. And and um, it's not about whether they should. It's, you know, who's entitled or just your own personal pride is is be the one that carries that. You know, I mean, I, I used to remember working in Hayfields, and my pride, and I wasn't a big guy, you know, but when my pride, I busted my butt to never get behind anybody. You know, I, I, you know, now I'm old enough now to be all for somebody out working it. Go ahead. You know, <laughs> back then, <laughs> you know, back then you were not going to outwork me. And that's just what I want people to get into is that is a fun sort of pride, not a I'm not going to work any harder than the next person attitude. Be the one to outwork them. I mean, just that's that's living life when you're when you're when you when you can uh, uh, lay your head down and you were the best one. Uh, you're, you're the best one in, in the national championships, or you're the best one in the hay field, or you're the best one at uh, working out on the bike trails. You just you just want to be the best, and uh, that, I, I feel that's like if awesome. you have that capacity, you do it. You know. Yep. So so that that kind of leads me into another question I had, and, mm-hmm. and so tell tell me tell me about the key character traits of some of your top performers, some of your top team team members or staff members. Or whichever one, you know, tell me, you know, when you think of like uh, well, you know, top performance. I, I, uh, and that's a big, that's a big question. I will tell you an interesting thing that we have learned um, in our sport. We, you know, you got to ride a lot of different type of horses. So some of the kids that have performed the best, actually, their parents were professionals. So they've had to ride everything under the sun. And I've always talked about that. They've had to ride the good horses, the bad horses, and that opportunity is huge. I mean, you can read. Uh, you know about the 10,000 hour rule and things like that 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 can make you great but this is something that I've learned in the past few years Mac that I've really realized about a lot of these trainers kids and this is something that anybody whatever you're in if your kids are involved in sports and stuff like that you need to pay attention to do you know the reason why I think they really have an advantage is because they've been told the truth early on Mm. you know um, they weren't clients you know, they didn't care whether you liked it or not. No, you actually uh, sucked on that horse today. I mean, <laughs> you weren't any good. And, and so they, they've uh, they've been told the truth. And I feel like that's the one thing that um, we get away from where so much blowing smoke and so much pumping up and so many wonderful posts and how great and and i think and you want to have some expectations and achievements you want your kid to have some wins and keep moving forward 100 percent, i believe in that but they got to hear the truth and now and i told some of these other coaches years ago i said you're going to start experiencing this too because um they're all recruiting travel ball there are some incredible travel ball coaches but then there are some that have kind of gotten to where they got to keep an income coming in. Their biggest deal is they got to keep you happy as a client, and mm-hmm. so they're not always telling the kids the truth. And um, so, and and that that has their coaches said, yeah, you know, that came true. They're uh, they get to college and all of a sudden they're being told the truth and they don't like it. So, um, 
you know, the, the, the best thing that you can do with, with kids is make sure that they have some hardships, make sure that they have to, you know, earn things, have a vested interest in stuff, but also, you know, let them have some bad experiences. Probably one of their big, big, best educational tools is if they do have a bad coach, if they do have a bad teacher. And, uh, you know, how they respond to that is probably a better, uh, better teaching tool in life than, than just when they have the easy ones. That's, that's good stuff. So I'm going to ask you a question. You may not remember this. Yeah. And if you don't, that's okay. And I just think okay. if there's a lesson in there for me or for somebody else or, or somewhere. But I remember when we right. have our board meetings and it was all the board members and you would always be there. And we'd have the, the officers and we were trying to build that mountain bike organization. And, and, and I remember when you said it at least once, maybe more, but it stuck in my mind. After one of those meetings, you said, I, I, I'm just always amazed at how quiet you are. That you just sit there and listen. Do you remember that? Um, I don't remember saying that, but I mean, I was talking about you uh, listening and taking stuff in. Yeah, I think so. I, I'm just curious what yep. you even what what you saw or what what that was because I'm sure it's a little lesson in there somewhere. Oh uh, well, well, the one. Well, I mean, I, I don't remember telling you that, but I remember watching you though. Is uh. The one thing is people want to be heard, and you would you would sit and listen in those meetings, um, and and nod and, and find common ground and 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 listen, but you were taking it all in. The one thing that we are in such a fast world, and I can be as bad as anybody, such a fast world. We take some information and we try to just do something with it instantly. Well, sometimes we get this information and let it just gel around for a while. A much better idea can form, and I think that's what was amazing. Me, I was just watching. You had wheels turning, but you were taking in a lot of information at that time. And um, you know, then sometimes there'd be ideas come out from you, and you'd pitch it, you know, to the group. And what if we did this? And what if we did that? And it was something that didn't even come up that night. But I think it was you taking in a lot of information, reforming it, uh, that created a, a, a whole new platform. Okay, I just had never asked you. I was always. Yeah, no, I you know, you said just, that to me one uh, time. You know, it's uh, we all have our opinions, and and you know, you you we oftentimes just want to just state them right away, but uh, it, it is amazing, and I have to check myself on on doing this too. It's just sometimes just listening for a while. Not only sometimes does my opinion get changed, but sometimes it doesn't even have to directly change. But sometimes my thought process. It adds a lot of information and a new way of thinking. I mean, that's just one of the greatest things in life is if you can keep coming up with just new ways of thinking. And, and it doesn't mean you have to fly back and forth like a ping pong ball on what you're trying to accomplish. <laughs> but listen, there's nothing wrong with tweaking your way up to the top either. You know, it's uh, um, there's there's a lot of value in, in, in information and the people that will – will gather that information and control it and use it are the ones that win. Um, okay. it's, ra it's, ra it's rarely as my first idea. I, I mean, I love gut instincts and all that, but my my first outline plan is not usually what I finish with. And so you really want to make sure that, I mean, you hear about uh, goals are in concrete, plans are in sand. You got, so you got to make sure that you keep in the sandbox, you know, that you can adjust and you can, as new information comes in, it makes you better. It doesn't make you change. It doesn't make you better. So, yeah, I think, yeah, you, you, you used to sit there and listen, and I think you, you use that information. Okay, and opinion, I was just curious. Sometimes, and sometimes I think what was good about you, Mac, is you just let an opinion come in there just so somebody could be heard, too. I mean that's that's a valuable piece. Is you know uh, sometimes we can't change the course of direction or something, but we want to be heard, you know. And I, and, and that just sometimes I, you know makes me feel good at somebody meeting just just listens to you. Uh, yep. May not be the outcome I want, but they they did listen. They listened, oh, took it in consideration. Okay. You gave some valuable insight in there. I knew I knew me asking that question to get you talking about some good stuff. It wasn't really about me as much as it was getting you to talk about the stuff in general. And that was great. So I got you said yesterday when we talked, and I want to make sure I get this in. You said one of the best investments someone can make is to hire a life coach. What, what what was that about? Oh, hiring a life coach, absolutely. 
Well, and listen, there's nobody more uncoachable than coaches, I think. You know, maybe at one point <laughs> we were the athlete, we were all right. But, um, <laughs> you know, we are – you know, I love joking with our athletic director. I thought, what a terrible job when you got to take over all these A personalities and, and as head coaches. But, uh, you know, investing in yourself is something so many people won't do. And there's other great things I've read about that. I mean, you know, the amount of money people spend on toilet paper – uh, versus books they read it's astronomical yeah. the difference you know and they just think of you know which end are you going to spend most of your money on and you really you know you really need to start reevaluating your priorities some but i um let me shoot to get to where i was was going with that to a life coach will make you money and Money isn't everything. We've talked about that. When people say, well, it's a way to keep score. But if nothing else, a life coach will make you money. And yeah. I, uh, to me, it's an economic decision. But that accountability, and most of them don't drill you like you think. Most life coaches actually kind of lead you to, you know, to where you want to be. Now, I've had some that I've had formally. I hired you for uh, uh, you know, our staff, and, I mean, you coached me for a while. And then I had a lot of mentors that I would use. And sometimes sometimes my life coaches were informal. Um, you know, a guy yep. told me a long time ago, and I use this, he said, feed rich people. And, hmm. you know, all he meant was you can always move up a little bit. I can't call Bill Gates and have lunch with him. But I can get somebody between me and Bill Gates and have lunch. You know, I can get them on the phone and – and I've had people do this to me, which is, you know, since I know what they're doing, it's kind of an honor. But it's it just <laughs> take them to lunch. And, but you buy their lunch. Yes, I know they're a multimillionaire and, the, you, and people expect <laughs> them to pay. You you buy their lunch. It's the cheapest. That's, I mean, my word, you can't get an education better than that. But if you just, you just say, listen, you know, I'm trying to do this. I know you're successful in it. If I could just take you to lunch, I would love just to ask you a couple questions. And they'll, you know, if, if they don't want to talk long, you'll know and stick to your couple questions but generally they'll draw more out and they most people really do want to help and um so that's i you know take people to lunch and 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 that's one of the best things you can do but then i would say as soon as you can and you find a a, a life coach that will work for you uh my daughter does that for other people and had great success and she is the probably the only person on this earth as hard-headed as i am and so uh <laughs> And that works really well for me. She just leads me to the answer I need to get to, and because uh, neither one of us likes stuff crammed down her throat, so, um, so she's it's been great. And she's you know it, it didn't happen intentionally. I just knew she was doing it. And the more we talked, and she was I mean because she's my daughter, she's gonna you know tell me stuff anyway. And I said no, no, okay, this is working. So I'm hiring you then. So then that way. I, you know, it yeah. was a professional relationship, so I could, uh, you know, call her when I needed to about just work stuff, and she could, you know, basically I had to, I put her to work, and uh, it's been valuable. It's been really valuable. Um, do I do everything? What's her name? If somebody was not. For? I know. I'm sorry. Oh, I know uh, her name. Tony. Tony. Tony, what's... Tony Patrick, and uh, I'm not. I'm not purely this old yet, but she. Uh, she really found a, a niche when she was working in home health, and so she, and, you know, um, just really became fascinated with um, people in the, the, you know, their later stages in life and what they wish they would have done and what they could have done, and so that's really become a, a, a passion of hers, you know, in life. So, I mean, she wrote a book called How to Grow Older, okay. and just it's loaded with stuff and really everybody should read probably in their 40s so they start setting themselves up it's just how to grow older and she's she's done some podcasts on it and um that's just been you know and then she does have some just you know what to do things too so particularly if you have aging parents or something like that how to have their stuff set up but a lot okay. of it's just about living life and that's 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 something that i do say if i use something about their generation feel like they've done a better job at their age than most of us have done where we were always you know what's next what's next and and always attacking things and sometimes we were missing life and mm. i've really learned a lot through hers about you've got to make sure you have experiences and that's what life is you know it's not just all about attacking the next business plan so 
it's been a, been a great educational piece for me. That's awesome. So about to have to wrap it up here. We we about fifty minutes in almost, but I want to I want to end on just thanking you for you know, always believing in me and supporting me. I remember when I I shared with you some point back about blue collar leadership, and you said, Mac, you got to do. You got to do blue collar leadership. So you you're one of my inter- inspirations for actually building this brand. Well, everybody expects everybody expects the CEOs and all that to have a big book list they read, and uh, the people that could have the steepest learning curve, the fastest amount of growth, really aren't the the executive types. It's a it's everyday working people that they were really to apply. They would actually get faster results than anybody else, and so that's what I I, I just I find it it's tough that people don't think that leadership is for everybody. And uh, we're about to end. The one thing I'll say we're in some we're in a unique situation right now. There's never been a better time, and I know some of you got to dodge the bullets first. But once that's done, it's done, and you're on some kind of ground. Lean into this new situation we've got. I know it's scary, but do not run away. This is the greatest time in life to lean into a problem. And uh, there are unique opportunities. Uh, we're, we're in a where we're facing a different world right now. This is probably one of the best times to make a transformational change. Uh, and that, uh, so it's it's the I'm, I tell you what, that's what I'm doing. I'm reading like crazy right now. I mean, I'm getting ready for this. Uh, uh, I'm going to lean into it. We're not. I'm not going to shrink from it. I'm going to lean into it. Well, I'm not going to mess that closing thought up. That was an outstanding closing thought. So all I'm going to do right here, Greg, is just thank you for taking your time, nearly you know, an hour out of your day to invest in me, invest in the, my listeners, and share your message, and let me share you. A lot of wind going on. So thank you very much for taking the time. Well, thank you and Rhea for investing in people. I appreciate it. All right, sir. So hope you hope you hope everybody listening today enjoyed the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast. Talk to you next time. Make it happen or someone else will. It might as well be you. Are you serious about taking your career and your life to the next level and beyond? Check out Max Story's Blue Collar Leadership Series books and others, now available on audio, along with paperback and ebooks at Amazon, iTunes, and Audible. Please visit bluecollarleadership.com to learn about Max books, programs, special offers, certifications, and more. Thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast.